Hey, this is Pastor Eric. Um, today I will not be with you live, but virtual Eric, or tonight, you may be here on Saturday night, uh, is here with you, which means I have paper notes. Very exciting. Not had those in a while, so I need my reading glasses. Um, but I'm glad for you to tune in. We're going to continue tonight in our study, or today, in our study of James chapter 1, later in the chapter. James, if you recall, we talked about a little bit last week, is the half-brother of Jesus, uh, Joseph and Mary, mom and dad, and James may have not believed that even Jesus was a Messiah initially. We know that his brothers, Jesus' brothers, came, and by the way, Jesus did have brothers, uh, came to get him um, thinking he was crazy. Uh, there was one time where they actually came to get him, and by this point, when the book of James is written, most likely the book of James is written to very early Jewish Christians, maybe even before Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John were written, we don't really know, but James obviously became a follower of Christ understood that Jesus was God, his own uh, half-brother believed in him, and that's who's writing this book. And so today we're continuing our series, Being Genuine in a Plastic World. And we all know people who are fake. We all know people uh, who don't say uh, what they mean. And so today we're going to talk about walking the walk. You know, you hear people talk about, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And uh, the key series in this verse, the key verse in this series is, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. That's James chapter 1, verse 26. So today we're going to talk about three habits to help you walk the walk. And I want to talk about what it's like to walk the walk. And one of my favorite things to do is to fish. I love to bass fish. For an ADD person, it gives me something to do, and yet it's relaxing. I am too lazy. Uh, I sometimes do spinner baits and other baits like that, but you have to work really hard at those type of things. And the truth is, I like, my favorite is to fish with rubber worms. Now let me tell you what the purpose of a rubber worm is. It's to deceive a fish into thinking it's something that it's not. And it tries to look as much as it can, but the truth is, this is not a real worm. It's not messy. It's not real. When you get close to it, it smells differently. All those things, it is not a real worm. Here's the truth about you and about me. Real Christians, Christians who walk with Jesus, are the difference between real and fake. And so when we say one thing with our mouths and tell people that we're Christians, and yet we don't do it, people see through it. Hey, that rhymes. <laughs> the truth is, too, that we all have been ripped off by somebody who did not practice what they preached. They came in, they told us they were a Christian contractor, or they were a Christian lawnmower person, or they were a Christian that did something else, and yet they, were, they felt free to rip us off. We all know people like that. I want to talk about these three things that we can do, habits to help us walk to walk, so that you and I don't become fake. Because the truth is, in our own selves, if we're not careful, we'll just get busy doing religious things and we'll no longer find satisfaction. See, here's the truth about people who talk the talk but don't walk the walk. There's no real life. If you are experiencing the Christian life and it has no real power and you're noticing in your Christian life that you're saying things but you're not always practicing what you say, then this message is for you. And maybe you know somebody like this, uh, you might want to cut and paste it to them today. So number one, present your presence as a present. And let's read this verse. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father's heavenly lights. Who does not change? And in the Greek, this idea of does not change is the idea he doesn't have a parallel life. We all know people who have a parallel life. They say one thing and do another. Or they tell you rules, but those rules don't apply to them. It's like when you see a policeman speed past you without his lights on. Well, they, maybe they're going somewhere important. But, you know, we see other people who say one thing and do another. God's not that way. He's always consistent. And it says, like shifting shadows. And then it continues. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now, this is really neat because you have to know who you are and know what God has given you so that you can live an authentic Christian life. If you feel like God doesn't really love you or care about you, you will become plastic. You'll pretend that you're a good Christian, but you have no power because you think God doesn't really care about me. He doesn't really love me. In this verse, you realize that what he says is we are God's first fruit. You know what that means? 
It means we are a special gift or we are a special present. When the Bible talked about first fruits, many times what it was talking about is the offering. And when you would first have a harvest, you would take the first part of that harvest and give it back to God. Imagine how exciting it was when you didn't know if anything would grow when all of a sudden you had a harvest. When all of a sudden that corn started coming up or the wheat started coming up or the other foods that you had planted started to prosper and then you realize, you know what, thank you God for what you've done. That's the reason in America that we had uh, Thanksgiving because we realized that we needed God and I love our Thanksgiving holiday to this day that does that. The Jews had a similar thing. Now, do you have anything on your shelf that's special? Now, I have this silly thing that I've had for years. I think this was an ice bucket, and somehow my mom ended up giving me this wooden ice bucket, and what happened is it was on the shelf, and I started by putting my keys in it, and then it got to where my coins went in it. Well, then it became where my special things went in here, so I knew where they were. And so in here, I have some interesting things. I've got uh, from the hotel in Taiwan when we got Jenna. I have this little pin that they gave us. I've never taken it out of the wrapper. I don't know where I would wear it, but it's a little pin of a hat. I have two tapes. This one is of a drum solo back in the 80s. I actually don't know if I have anything to play these on. Um, and then my most special possession. I've got marbles that were my dad's in here. I've got my dad, a couple of things of my dad's. I've got, when I graduated seminary and I finished my doctorate, we went to this restaurant and I have uh, uh, matches from there. But here's my most special possession in here. It's the watch, the last watch, the one of the last gifts I gave my dad. There's actually concrete on him. I gave him a watch. He wanted a watch he could wear to work to do construction. And this actually has concrete on it that my dad got on this watch. It's very special to me. It wouldn't mean anything to you, but it's very special to me. So here's what I want you to know. Listen, you sometimes don't realize you're a gift. And not only are you a gift, you're a gift with gifts. That's why I said present your presence as a present. And so what are you doing? God created you to be a present. But not only did he create you to be a present, he filled you with presents. He filled you with gifts that you can give to other people. Are you using those gifts? Because here's the deal. If you don't realize that you're special, you won't go out of your way to help anybody else. You'll become selfish and self-centered. You'll only worry, oh, poor me. You'll be like Eeyore all the time. You don't care about anybody else. You pretend you care, but you don't do anything for anybody else. But when you understand, I am precious. I am loved by God. I'm a present. And guess what? He's given me things to give away to other people. You know, what are the gifts that God's given you? Maybe for you, one of the gifts God's given you is you're able to cook. And so maybe as a gift, one of the things you can do is make soup for your next door neighbor when they're sick. Or maybe you're really good at moving furniture, so you help your friend move furniture. Or maybe, you know, whatever the gift is, maybe it's helping in the nursery, maybe it's helping with the sound, maybe it's helping with the production team, maybe it's helping with the children's ministry, helping on the A-team that we're starting at our church um, to go out of our way to serve other people. What is that present? And you can present your presence as a present. And that's when you begin to do that, you begin to find joy in the Christian life. Listen to what it says in 2 Thessalonians. But we should always thank or she should always thank God for you. Brothers and sisters loved by the Lord. Do you realize you're loved by God? Because God chose you as first fruits. Here's that word again, first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel why? So that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. So what's he saying? So in Thessalonians, he's saying, hey, listen, look at the verses, look at what I've written. James is reminding us, your first fruits, look at what I've written and remember who you are. See, if we're going to be able to walk the walk and do what God wants us to do, we have to realize that we are precious to him. Don't you have something on your shelf or something at your house that somebody else would probably throw away, but to you it's precious? Listen, you are precious to God. Even if somebody else told you you were not precious, you are precious to God. All right, let's go to number two. Number two, practice what is preached. Now, never forget years ago, I uh, 
I had a really busy day. I went to the hospital. I went and visited some people. I went to a meeting with a bunch of pastors, and it was uh, just a great busy day. And I got home, and I walked into my bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, and I was wearing my dress shirt inside out. When I looked in the mirror, I was wearing my dress shirt inside out. Have any of you ever? No, you've, you've probably never done that. Now, you may have done other things, had something in your teeth, but most people have never done that. Why? Because you have friends who would tell you, listen, a good friend will tell you when your shirt is inside out or when your your uh, pants get tucked into your boot or if your uh, shirt is doing something funny, your friends will tell you. All day long I went and realized I do not have good friends. <laughs> no, I think they just didn't notice. Maybe this dress shirt looked like a t-shirt inside out. I don't know. But here's the truth. The Bible is like that for us. If we look like we do in a mirror when we spend time in God's word, it speaks to us. Listen to what it says. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. That's why God gave you two ears, right? And one mouth. <laughs> be quick to listen, slow to speak, and notice this is in here, slow to become angry. Why? Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Listen, when we become angry, we can't think clearly. And let's be honest, most of the time we get angry because we want control. There's other reasons we get angry, but a lot of times it's because we're hurt or we don't like how we're being treated. And then it continues. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like or he doesn't realize his shirt is inside out. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now here's the question. The reason the anger is such a big deal is because when we're angry, we don't think straight. When we're angry, we tend to not hear things. And so here's the truth. When's the last time you really thought of and listened to what God's word said? Every time you have a devotion in the morning, whether it's the daily bread or whether you're reading part of your Bible, I want to encourage you before you do it, say, God, would you speak to my heart today? You might even want to say, God, I humble myself before you. Speak to me today. And let God, as you read his word, transform you, change you. Here's the thing. You can't just look at something. What does it say? It says you're going to forget about it. Well, why do we forget about God's word? Because the truth is when we looked, we didn't really look. And so when we read the Bible or when we hear a sermon that uses scripture, we need to sit, to sit there and meditate on it. Let it sink into our hearts. You know, meditation was in the Bible way before it was anywhere else. And here's the truth about meditation. It means taking one of those thoughts and just remembering it over and over. Actually, the word meditation comes from a cow chewing cud, which is disgusting. But when you think about it, what does he do? He swallows it. He chews on it. He swallows it. And then he chews on it again. It's such a beautiful picture. But here's the deal. That's what we need to do with God's word. Maybe take a verse, put it on a card, and put it in your car to take with you every day. Or put it in your cubicle at work. Or maybe if you work somewhere you can't do that, put it on your mirror. Maybe you'll actually look at your mirror, unlike me, and put the verse there to remind you of what God wants. If you're struggling with anger, put a verse about anger. Let God change you. If you're struggling with perseverance, put a verse about perseverance. If you're struggling with being discouraged, put verses about Courage. My dog is obviously not struggling with courage right now. He's barking. <laughs> Matthew 23, Jesus said this. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Jesus here is talking about the Pharisees, and he said, hey, don't do what they do. Because they will tell you all kinds of things, but they won't do them. Let me ask you this. Do you do the things that God shows you in your life? Because here's the deal. If you don't say yes to God in one area, don't expect to hear, of, hear about it or don't expect to hear from him in another area. God calls us to obedience and he will stay right there and give you retakes and test you over and over. See, in the early church, they had trouble with these 
Christians who were Jewish who would come in and they wanted to practice the law, but they didn't really practice love and grace and truth. When you find yourself angry and frustrated with people, my question is this, are you really carrying out what God called us to do as Christians or are you using the Bible as a weapon in order to put others down? Finally, number three, so we've presented our present as a present. We've practiced what is preached and I love this, my favorite. Number three, pipe down and protect. You ever been told to pipe down? That's a really old word for be quiet. Pipe down over there like my mom's dog who's decided to bark now. Pipe down over there. Let's be quiet over there. And so, and they, all the dogs have decided now to bark. So, pipe down, will you? And so, <laughs> here's the deal. They have done studies and discovered that when a baby is crying, you can't focus. They say the very worst time to try to make a decision is when a baby is crying. Why? We're not made to have that chaos. And when dogs are circling around you and barking, it makes it very hard to concentrate. Just like my dog started barking for purpose of illustration, of course. Um, sometimes we have to realize that we need to get quiet in order to do what God's called us to do. And beyond that, we have to do what he's called us to do, which is protect others. So pipe down and protect. Too many of us want to control life, and so we can't hear. Listen to what it says in James 1, 26 and 27. Those who consider themselves religious. So if you consider yourself a good Christian and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves. And their religion, listen to this, is worthless. Religion that God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So what's it like? If somebody says a bunch of religious things, but they live a different way, it drives us crazy. And I was trying to think of what this would be like, and I thought of, going to Subway. I don't know if you've ever gone to one of those sub shops where you go through the line and they make your sub for you. Subway lets you pick the different things. Imagine if you were in Subway, you got about halfway down the line. Now be careful, this is going to be disgusting. You got halfway down the line and the person putting your food on licked their fingers and then kept making your sandwich. You at that point could care less how good the sandwich is. <laughs> All you would care about is why in the world would that idiot do that? Listen, too many of us are talking about Jesus, talking about what he wants us to do, and yet our lives don't reflect him. What does it look like when our lives reflect him? It says this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So what does that look like? Are you looking after other people? See, there's a, there's a vast difference. When you're religious but not doing what you said, if you're, if you're pretend religious, if you're a fake religious person, you're trying to control people. So you get angry, you yell, you're frustrated. When you see somebody who's poor, you say, oh, they, they've gotten what they deserve. You know, you're, you're very strong in your belief, but you're fake. But what do you do when you're a true believer, when you're truly religious? You protect orphans and widows. You go out of your way to protect the weak. Those who can't take care of themselves, you will protect them. Listen to what it says in Micah 6, 8 in the Old Testament. If you think this is just a New Testament idea, listen to this. He has shown you, O mortal, or O man, they say sometimes, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What does God want you to do? He wants you to act justly, be just with people to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. You know, this week I got a letter from our compassion child. We sponsor a child in Bolivia who lives on a mountain. She's about six years old now, and she has school through Compassion International, and she's able to get food, and we're able to get letters from her, and we send her letters of what's going on, and she said she was praying uh, for us, which was really neat. But one of the neatest things she said at the very bottom of her letter, she said this, would you pray that she said, I'm able to get on the computer and have school in Bolivia. Other kids don't have computers. So could you pray that the kids that don't have computers would be able to have school? Here's a child living in what we would consider abject poverty. And yet she cares about those that are even poorer than she is. Listen, in America, we're all very wealthy. In America, we have a lot of things together. But the truth is, if we want to do what God's called us to do, what do we have to do? Care for those who have needs, who have help. Listen, 
in your life, are you able to do these three things? If you're frustrated with your Christian life, if you feel like your Christian life is not a place of growth, well, then maybe you need to recognize who you are in Christ. You can present that present. Are you using the gifts God's given you? Or is it number two, you're, not, you're listening to what's preached, but you're not really practicing. Maybe it's time to just take one of the lessons that you learned and put it into practice. Or number three, maybe it's time to just get quiet, to pipe down and to protect those who are hurting. Those are your three challenges today. Listen, if you're here today and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, Steve is here today and we'll have somebody who can talk to you or David can talk to you after church. If you want to talk to them about what it means to be a Christian, you can do that today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To be a Christian means that you surrender your life to him. If you're ready to do that today, I'd encourage you to talk to one of these people. Normally we do our offering here, but we're not collecting offering right now. So if you're watching online or if you're in a service today, I want to encourage you, you can give online. If you're in a service, you can give at the back on your way out. If you have any questions or prayer comments, feel free to leave a note. I'll be back this week and be able to get those prayer requests. Thanks for taking a few minutes to listen to this sermon. I hope that it blesses you right where you're at, James chapter 1. Next week, we'll be in James chapter 2. Thanks for watching.